body. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I'm joined in the studio by my producer, Joel. And boy, do we have a crazy, terrifying tale for you today. We are going to be covering the possession of Janet Moses. And this is a story that really brings to light the issue of demonic possession and where, you know, where does that line sort of end and mental illness comes into play. And really, it's a very, very tragic story of how one deals with somebody who's either possessed or suffering from severe mental illness and things go terribly wrong. So that is what we're going to be diving into today. Before we start, though, I'm sure you can probably hear it in my voice. I sound congested. Yeah, you do a little bit. I'm sorry about that. This past week was actually my birthday, and I went out of town to go try to relax, get away from work, and also see my parents up in uh, the Seattle, Washington area. And of course, as I get off the plane, literally just snot comes streaming out of my face, would not stop for two days, had a fever of 100 degrees, literally just so congested, like my face was puffed up, my just pain. And so I'm still recovering from that. Um, and that was like five days ago. So I apologize for the congestion, um, but I thought you should know that this is not <laughs> the new normal for me. Yeah, definitely not. But I also wanted to let you know that we are actually currently working on a Halloween merch drop, and this is really going to happen this time. I know if you've been listening for a while, I've been voicing that there's going to be another merch drop coming, and it just hasn't happened because we've had a lot of things happening behind the scenes, and it's just taken longer to really nail down the designs that I wanted to do. But I think we finally got something really cool put together. And so that will be going live on October 29th when that episode of Lights Out uh, airs. And that is when things will go on sale. And again, that'll be at milehiremerch.com. Also, I wanted to let you know that my CBD company, Higher Love Wellness, we recently launched a pineapple wax, which is so, so delicious. And if you've never tried dabbing CBD before, it is amazing stuff. Uh, Because you get all of the benefits of both medicinally of just, you know, making your body feel better. It's great for the endocannabinoid system in your body, which helps just regulate pretty much everything. But also it just feels really good. I mean, it's, it's the high without the high. I like to say, um, it doesn't actually get you high psychoactively, but it does just take the edge off for Mm. you. It's the most effective way to consume it. And it's got that delicious fruity tones of pineapple in there. And again, you can dab that with our turp pen that we have for sale at higherlovewellness.com. And as a listener of the show, if you use code homies, you get 10% off any day of the week. So I just want to put that out there. We do have some new stuff at higherlovewellness.com. But this episode of the Lights Out podcast is brought to you by Talkspace, Blenders, and Hellfresh. But let's go ahead and jump into this absolutely insane story out of New Zealand, actually. I think this is the first time we've covered uh, a story out of New Zealand. And I'm just going to give you forewarning that I tried my best to learn the pronunciations of these words i mean we're going to be talking about the maori which are the indigenous people of new zealand and a lot about their culture we're going to use some of the uh, words from basically their language and i'm going to do my very best to pronounce them the correct way but obviously these are very very difficult words as you'll hear and forgive me anybody out there who is from new zealand if i butcher some of these but i'm gonna do my best so bear with me But let's go ahead and get into this absolutely insane story. The shadow of a lion had once lurked in the Rawery family's living room. It is no longer there, but its spirit haunts the family as they sit with their heads in their hands. Some cry in grief and others shake their heads in disbelief. In the middle of the living room, a dead woman lies in a small twin bed. She was a sister, a daughter, a niece, an aunt, and a mother. They had loved her, and she had loved them. She lies there motionless, surrounded by her family. She is covered in gallons of water and smells of her own urine. 
Water completely soaks the carpet of the living room floor, and each step the investigators take through the house makes a loud squishing sound. They flash their badges and shine their flashlights around the room. The small house is dark, damp, and filled with misery. The blinds are closed, and the room is at least 100 degrees. The woman's body is covered in bruises and small streams of water drain from her mouth. Her jaws clenched and small red dots cover her forehead. Her lifeless eyes stare into the void above. She had died from drowning above water. She had been killed by a crime of love. Breaking the silence, someone says it was an accident that the family had tried to drive the demon out of her. The Makatu had invaded. They loved her and would do anything to save her from this curse. But how could a family so close, bound by so much love, end up killing one of their own? How could their faith lead them down a path so evil? A long shadow of tradition, fear, and hysteria clouds the Rawari family and they will slowly come to terms with what they have done. The paramedics lay the corpse on a stretcher and carry her out of a dark and cursed house. Only the cries of the family can be heard in the distance. And this is the possession of Janet Moses. Janet Moses was a 22-year-old loving mother of two. She came from a large family who was all extremely close. They went out together on weekends and even had their own sports league together. Many of the Rawari family considered their cousins as their closest friends, and each family member always had the other's back. Through thick and thin, the Rawari family would always help a loved one in need. Janet's maternal grandmother had always been the respected matriarch. She was the force of love and guidance in the Rawari family and she always had the last say in family affairs. They all lived in and around the suburb of New Zealand, called Wainui Omada, and they often gathered at their grandmother's house for holidays and celebrations. All of them were of Maori descent, an indigenous group from New Zealand who still kept their culture and traditions close to their heart. Much love surrounded the family, and their Maori culture guided their customs. One day, Janet's grandmother passed away, leaving behind a large void in the heart of the Rawari family. Their matriarch, their leader, was gone. She always had an excellent sense of direction and morality, and now the family had to move on without her. And not long after the death of her grandmother, Janet began to change. While everyone understood that each person handles grief differently, it seemed to affect Janet with a much greater weight and the rest of the family could tell that the light inside of her quickly began to fade. Something wasn't right, and whispers began spreading around the tight-knit family. On October 6, 2007, Janet's sister celebrated her birthday at a local watering hole. As always, the whole family came to share in the festivities. They drank, laughed, and danced. All were merry, except a dark cloud that hung over the far side of the bar. Janet Moses sulked in the corner. Her shoulders slumped towards the floor and her eyes stared into space. Her hair was unkempt and her clothes were dirty. Relatives came up and spoke to her, but Janet rarely responded. And throughout the bar, the family spoke of their concerns. At one point in the night, another shadow appeared in the bar. It was Janet's boyfriend, Shane. On top of her grandmother's death, Janet had been tormented by her failing relationship with her partner. She had recently found out that Shane had been cheating on her, and rumors also spread about emotional and physical abuse within their relationship. After a recent blowout between them, Shane took their two children and went to live with his parents. And since then, Janet only saw her children every so often. After a brief argument at the party, Shane left, and Janet went back to staring into space. The birthday party eventually winded down, and everyone went home. They whispered to each other about their concerns surrounding Janet. And this would be the last night Janet's family would see her, before her plunge into complete madness. The next morning, Sunday, October 7th, Janet's aunt woke up to find her walking barefoot in the streets. She wandered aimlessly in her pajamas and mumbled something under her breath. When her aunt came to grab her, 
She heard the low, gentle hum of her chant. They're coming. They're coming. They are coming. They are coming. In repetition over and over, she spoke these words, and she chanted them fast and then slow. Her eyes scanned the sidewalks, houses, and trees as if someone or something was approaching. In shock at Janet's behavior, her family decided the best plan of action was to take her to her Uncle Johnny's house. Uncle Johnny and Aunt Glennis had taken over the role of the family leaders when their grandmother had died. In need of strong leadership within the family, they took on this role with their best intentions. So they called for a hui, a New Zealand term for a family gathering, as they needed to discuss what they would do with Janet. In the cramped one-story house, they rolled a twin bed into the living room for Janet to rest in. She rarely spoke to anyone, and she often stared at the ground and repeated her mantra over and over. They are coming. They are coming. They noticed Janet's other strange behavior of always wanting to be warm. Even in the sweltering heat of September in New Zealand, Janet continued to wear jackets and cover herself in blankets. As she sat in the living room bed, dozens of family members gathered at the house. Each one individually came up to her and apologized for anything they might have done to hurt her. They reminded her how much they loved her, and they would stick around for as long as they were needed. But Janet? She would just only stare at the ground in response. But they all hoped she had heard them, and none of them would give up on her. The Rariri family was a tribe that never turned its back on a loved one. Some of them stayed to cook and clean, and others sat around the house in worry. After a long day, many returned to their homes, and Janet fell asleep in the living room. In the dark corner, a white statue of a lion glared out into the room, its sharp eyes cast an eerie shadow. Its long, curly mane flowed down to its legs. It looked much like an ordinary lion statue, yet Janet sensed the presence of something much more evil within. In the dead of night, the family awoke to the sounds of her screams, and they ran to the living room and found her in an absolute state of panic. She screamed and screamed, pointing at the statue as if a horrific spirit pulsed from within the stone. In shock and confusion, the family members looked at each other. What at first seemed like an ordinary statue actually carried a family secret. They all knew that Janet's sister had supposedly stolen the statue several weeks earlier, and instead of returning it, they kept it in Uncle Johnny's living room. The line was a symbol of the Rawiri family and also the insignia of their sports team. Uncle Johnny even had a tattoo of a lion, and he believed the statue would bring good fortune. But now seeing Janet lose her mind at the sight of it, the family feared the lion statue had cursed the family as payback for stealing it. In fear for Janet's safety and the safety of the entire family, on the following day, on October 8th, they contacted their Uncle Jimmy Rahi. Uncle Jimmy was a Tohunga, and Maori culture... A tohunga acts as a medium between the physical and spiritual world, somewhat like a priest. In their faith, the tohunga is highly respected and seen as experts in their field. They are believed to access the divine nature of the world around them and know how to fend off evil spirits. So from their fear of the lion statue and Janet's illness getting worse, they decided that Uncle Jimmy would be their best bet at healing the family. He entered the docile house where Janet twisted and turned in the twin bed. The family surrounded her and held her hands. Uncle Jimmy read from the Maori scripture, said a prayer, and blessed Janet with holy water. After looking over Janet, he told the family that he believed Makatu was at play. In Maori beliefs, Makatu was an evil spirit or a curse that possessed things and people in the physical world. It is also known to target the weakest family member, and Janet had a long history of always being sick as a child. Even though the family considered that Janet may be suffering from mental illness, there is a strong distrust of doctors, especially white doctors, and Maori culture. After decades of colonialism and the struggle to keep their culture alive, Maori people 
tried their best to keep a firm hold on their traditions. This included the belief that white doctors would misdiagnose a patient with mental illness, even when Maori people think they are afflicted by Makatu. So taking Janet to the hospital was out of the question. Makatu is thought to be used for defense and revenge. During his visit, Uncle Jimmy warned the family of a vision he had. He saw three claws tearing into Janet Moses. He told them of the unresolved issues that surrounded her. Two of the claws involved the stolen lion statue, and the other involved Janet's recent struggles with her partner Shane. To fend off the Makatu and allow the healing process to begin, he told the family that they must come together and remove the claws from Janet. First, he told them that they must return the lion statue from where it came from. The spirit of the lion had been filled with rage because it was taken away from its partner. The statue had been stolen from the Grayton Hotel, and its partner, an identical lion statue, had once stood adjacent to it. The Tohunga claimed these lions had been together for over a century, and after stealing it, they had broken a sacred bond between them. And to set things right, they needed to reconnect the lions. By now, the entire Rawari family had become invested in defending their homestead against the Makatu, and many of them had taken off work to stay at Uncle Johnny's and care for Janet. And now that they believed an evil curse had been set upon them, they knew it would take all of their efforts to exorcise the Makatu from their family. As close as the Rawari family was, they planned on doing anything together from here on out. The whole family piled into their cars and loaded up the lion statue and they were going to return it immediately. Janet traveled in a car with her aunt, uncle, and paternal grandmother. But while driving there, Janet began fidgeting in her seat and mumbling to herself. And this mumbling eventually grew and grew until she started speaking nonsense. As they tried to calm her, she began lashing out at her grandmother. Screaming and yelling, She threatened to kill her grandmother the moment they got out of the car, and in horror, the rest of the family members tried to restrain her and calm her down. Luckily, this worked. But her grandmother was clearly shaken by the outburst. She feared for her life and had to sit next to Janet for the rest of the ride. Confused and scared, she quickly got out of the car once they arrived. And for the rest of the day, she made sure to keep a healthy distance between herself and Janet. When the rest of the family arrived at the hotel, they carefully unloaded the lion statue and returned it to its rightful place. And as it sat beside its partner, the family gathered around the two statues. Jimmy led a prayer service as each of the family members prayed with the deepest sincerity. Everyone wanted this nightmare to be over. Everyone wanted Janet to return to her old self. So they prayed and prayed. And now that the lion had been reconnected with its partner, they believed that finally things would be okay. After they returned home, hopeful that their penance worked, for a while it seemed like Janet was on her way to recovering. She no longer had any outbursts, and the family felt so relieved that they all decided to go out for dinner. But as they clinked their glasses and ate their food, this moment of grace wouldn't last. As this was only the eye of the storm that was approaching. From here, things only take a turn for the worst. But before we continue, we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back. Sometimes it feels like we can't fully be ourselves, especially when reaching out to a friend starts to get uncomfortable. There's always those times in life where you just need to get unbiased feedback, and now you can. You can get advice from a licensed professional pretty much whenever you want. Talkspace makes it easy to match up with a licensed therapist and schedule live video sessions all from the comfort of your device. And you can start messaging your therapist the same day that you sign up. Whether you're a parent, student, millennial, or just someone having a hard day, Talkspace can provide the support to help you feel better with a single message. Talkspace offers individual and couples therapy in addition to medication prescription services. You can set goals with your therapist and they can help make sure you're really progressing. But the best thing about Talkspace is that they actually work around your schedule and at your convenience. You can send and receive unlimited messages with your dedicated therapist in the app, which is truly amazing. You don't get that from going to see a therapist from a traditional type of office. You can schedule live video sessions with your licensed therapist from anywhere. 
Whether you're experiencing depression, anxiety, or other problems, Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform to help you sort through any issue. Seriously, therapy is one of the best things you could possibly do for yourself. I always thought that I didn't need therapy until I went and saw a therapist. There's something about talking to somebody who has nothing to do with your situation, doesn't know any of the people that you're talking about, and getting their view on things and really getting a good idea if you are in the right headspace or not. That is just so helpful and comforting. So start feeling better with a single message and match with a licensed therapist when you go to Talkspace.com and you get $100 off your first month with the promo code Lights Out. Again, that's $100 off when you use code Lights Out at Talkspace.com. Check it out today. Fresh out of San Diego, California comes the only sunglasses brand that I'll probably ever wear again. I'm talking about Blender's Eyewear, and you're going to be just as hooked when you see how awesome these shades are. I've got a number of different pairs of shades from these guys, and I got to say these shades are some of the best quality I've ever had, just period, with sunglasses, but also the styles. The styles are all so fresh, and they have a style that you'll absolutely love, guaranteed. I can't even tell you how many sunglasses I've lost in the ocean before. Like, I'll go out there and be like, oh, you know, I don't care that much about these, and I'll lose them and be like, ah, $200 down the drain. But the blenders, it doesn't hurt as bad. I lost a pair of blenders on my last trip to Florida, actually. And instead of crying about $200, it was like 30, 40 bucks. So I was like, you know what? I'll just go get some more. No big deal. You can get four pairs for the price of one, really. And Blender's team of in-house designers are constantly coming out with new styles. They got orange polarized wraparounds, tortoiseshell frames with purple lenses, every color lens you could possibly think of, and every possible style you could possibly want. And it's not just sunglasses. Blender's also has prescription glasses, readers, and blue lights. And now they even have a snow collection with goggles, which I'm looking forward to try once snowboard season comes around. So live life in forward motion with Blenders today and score 15% off your Blenders purchase. Just visit BlendersEyewear.com and enter promo code LIGHTSOUTVIP. That's BlendersEyewear.com. Code LIGHTSOUTVIP for 15% off with Blenders. You rock with pride worldwide. And our last sponsor for today is HelloFresh. You guys know how much I love HelloFresh. Literally, I probably wouldn't even eat if I didn't have HelloFresh because it comes in clutch every single week for us. I get several meals every week that I cook from HelloFresh. In fact, I just made some shoyu ramen last night. Absolutely delicious. And it actually taught me how you make ramen in the first place. I never really knew what was in traditional ramen recipe before. So I absolutely love HelloFresh, the convenience of having it shipped to my door. Everything's pre-measured. I don't have to go grocery shopping. I don't have to think about you know what I'm going to eat this week. It just takes all of the pain and stress out of eating, really. HelloFresh offers 50 menu market items to choose from every week. You can get vegetarian meals, calorie smart choices to extra special gourmet options, which I absolutely love. And there's going to be something that you will enjoy guaranteed. Right now, the fall harvest is officially on with HelloFresh and you can count on seasonal recipes like pumpkin cinnamon rolls. Oh, that sounds so good. And Friendsgiving ready sides, as well as fresh high quality ingredients that travel from the farm to your front door in less than a week. The best thing about HelloFresh though is that it's over 30% cheaper than shopping at grocery stores because of the fact that the ingredients are pre-portioned. You won't spend money on excess food that just ends up going into the trash. The flexibility is great. You can stop and start your subscription whenever. You can skip a week if needed. You can change your plan size. So maybe you just need it for the two of you or maybe you need it for your whole family. They can accommodate both options. So go to HelloFresh.com slash LightsOut14 and use code LightsOut14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash LightsOut14 and use code LightsOut14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit, and I back that up 100%. So Jimmy Rahi, the Tohunga that had guided the family this far, said his farewell. He had an operation scheduled and needed to be hospitalized for several days. The family wasn't too concerned with him leaving, and they had high hopes that Janet had finally been released from the Makatu's clutch. It seemed like Janet was finally healing, and she appeared calm and aware of her surroundings. Before Jimmy left, he told the family that two of the claws had been removed. Only one remained. Janet still needed to reconcile her relationship with Shane, and she needed the strength and support of her family in order to do so. After an exhausting few days, Janet went back to sleep in the middle of Uncle Johnny's living room, 
surrounded by her family, and to carry on with the healing process, they stood up and joined together around Janet. In Maori tradition, they began to chant a karakia, which this ritual is a form of incantation. Everyone begins chanting the same phrase over and over in hopes of becoming one with their ancestors within the eternal present. They repeated the words, go with peace and love, as they stood around Janet. And in the early moments of the karakia, they sang the words together in a simple melody. Go with peace and love. 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 That's just such a comforting saying, honestly. It does. It feels really good to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> some of them also spoke some soft prayers. But soon they realized that Janet wasn't responding well to their peace and love. She returned to her old habits of squirming and twitching on the bed while repeating the words. They are coming. They are coming. They are coming. Another time she said, The money, the money, the money, the money. And it quickly became apparent to the family that Janet was not on the path of healing as they thought. If anything, she was getting worse. Her veins popped from her forehead and she began screaming in desperation. During their karakia ritual, they poured water onto Janet and also forced her to drink it. Maori rituals often involve water as a symbol of healing. Some say the significance of water might be an influence from Christianity during the colonialism of New Zealand. Water in the Christian faith is seen as new life. Many Maori customs have fused with Christian practices over the years, and the family even prayed to Jesus for help and guidance. As the day dragged on, their ritual escalated. Their karakia became less of a song and more of an aggressive chant. Even a nearby neighbor claimed to have heard them chanting and stomping their feet. Over and over they said, go with peace and love, and this went on for hours. After an exhausting amount of time, they took a break from their karakia. They sat on their uncle's porch as they always had, and Janet walked outside and had a cigarette with her cousins as well. And once they were done smoking, they headed back inside. This small, insignificant smoke break would later become a pivotal moment in Janet's undoing. The family saw these smoke breaks as Janet's consent, and their argument was that she had every chance to walk away, but she came back inside the house every time. So that meant they could continue their ritual. But if Janet was mentally ill, did she even have the capacity to give consent? How could she have understood the circumstances, especially when surrounded by her loving family? The people that she believed would always protect her. As the ritual continued, one of Janet's paternal relatives suggested that the family should find another, Tohunga. The family needed further guidance in a battle against a Makatu, and none of them were experts in Maori rituals. But the Rawari family declined they decided to continue the ritual without a Tohunga present, as this was now a personal family matter. Isolated and desperate, they continued the ritual. On the evening of Wednesday, October 10th, the darkness within the household intensified. The chanting continued, go with peace and love. Yet Janet wasn't getting any better. During the ritual, Shane showed up at the house. He pulled up in his car and walked towards the front door but the family members wouldn't let him in. He told them he wanted to see Janet, and the family dismissed him without even asking Janet if she wanted to see Shane. Shane called out to her from outside the home, but the family quickly kicked him off the property. While inside, Janet repeatedly insisted on wanting a shower, and she finally made her way into the bathroom. She turned on the water, crawled into the shower fully clothed, the family didn't understand her desperate need to be in the shower, but some of them thought it was a way for her to reconnect with her late grandmother. As Janet used to bathe her grandmother in her later years, and she may have seen the shower as a place of cleansing and rejuvenation. The symbol of water continued to present itself throughout the ritual. Perhaps there was an instinctual response of being in the water spiritually or physically. But regardless of her reasoning, Janet desperately wanted to be in the shower. 
as she stood there drenching in her clothes and her hair. The family kept coming in to check on her, and each time they noticed she had the water temperature set to hot. And as the family questioned why Janet needed to be in the shower so badly, they began to suspect that it had something to do with the Makatu. They convinced themselves that in some way, the Makatu gained strength as Janet stood under the hot water. In fear of the Makatu destroying their progress, the family member would then yank the shower handle and turn it to freezing cold, and they held her under the water as the frigid water tortured her. They figured that if the Makatu wanted hot water, the cold water would drive the spirit away. Janet screamed and screamed and she pleaded for warmer water as the freezing temperatures chilled her entire body, but none of them listened to her. They held her under the freezing water for so long she eventually vomited bile and mucus onto the floor. While some would consider this torture, the family members thought they were banishing the Makatu. They believed that as she threw up she was also purging the curse. As the mayhem escalated, Janet's absent father, Gerald Moses, eventually showed up. And rather than being a voice of reason from the outside, he joined in on the ritual. He held Janet in the shower, and after she vomited, he held her down on the bed as they continued to chant. He took part in the karakia and didn't question the rituals they were performing. At one point, he told the family he wanted Janet to come with him, but the family refused. They thought it would be better to continue the ritual since they believed they were making progress. And after hours of torture for the first time that night, Janet seemed to calm down. The family believed she was finally responding to their efforts, but she was most likely just exhausted from the torturous rituals they were performing on her. She got up and wandered around aimlessly and then returned to the bed for rest. Janet's relaxation was a relief to the family, and they thought, finally, we've broken through. Many of them had been totally isolated for the past several days, and some hadn't seen their children even, and many were just sleep deprived from the constant karakia. No one but the family was let inside the house, and this one peak of light meant that they might be able to return home soon. Over 40 of them were cramped into the tiny house of Uncle Johnny, and they all suffered from the same poison cloud of panic that lurked within the home. They were willing to stay as long as needed even if that meant sacrificing their own well-being. The house was still well over 100 degrees, and they had barely slept, and food was scarce. The constant chanting became disorienting, and the fear of the Makatu scrambled their thoughts, and they weren't even allowed to use the bathroom, so many of them wore diapers to relieve themselves. And soon enough, when they finally thought the clouds were breaking during this horrific struggle, Janet had another episode. Her mantra began again, They are coming. They are coming. As she's twisting and turning in the bed, chanting, They are coming. They are coming. Who or what was coming? The sleep-deprived family members began thinking that Janet was warning them of some demonic creature heading towards the house. They thought Janet knew something about the Makatu. Maybe she saw something that they could not. So they grabbed broomsticks and knives from the kitchen and began slashing and hitting the air. They thought the demons were invisible, but they tried their best to fend them off. The affliction of mass hysteria had come down hard on the family, and they all quickly began losing their wits. They began justifying irrational thoughts, connecting unrelated objects and events between Janet and the Makatu. Anything and everything became a suspect of the Makatu. As they looked down at Janet, Writhing and screaming, there hung a bone carving around her neck. Shane had given this to her as a gift. They quickly suspected that the bone carving was trickled with demon energy. Remembering that Shane was a claw in Jimmy's vision, the family tore the bone carving from her neck and disposed of it. As they continued to pour water on Janet, they formed an assembly line from the kitchen to the living room. They filled up bowls and buckets of water in the kitchen and passed them down the line until they reached Janet. The kitchen faucet ran non-stop as they poured gallons of water into Janet's eyes and mouth. And the chanting continued, Go with peace and love. Go with peace and love. Bowl after bowl. Bucket after bucket. The entire house flooded with water. 
One of the family members drilled a hole into the kitchen floor to drain the water out of the house. In the midst of a nightmare, some of the family members later admitted that taking Janet to the hospital had crossed their minds, but the power of the group mentality had overpowered them. The tangible fear of the Makatu dictated everything they did, and if anyone thought to stop the ritual, they knew the family would see them as a pawn for the Makatu. And no one wanted to be in Janet's position. As the ritual continued, some adults claimed that the Makatu attacked them through Janet's eyes, so they made a rule not to look into her eyes, and some of them even began sucking on her eyes with their mouths. Believing that her eyes were weapons, they began thinking that some of the children had been consumed by the Makatu when they had gazed into Janet's eyes. So the family began the ritual on another family member, a teenage girl whose name would never be revealed. They believed that the Makatu was doubling its power, and the girl had become the second lion. Now two of their family members were held down by dozens of other family members, and Janet and the girl struggled to free themselves but they weren't strong enough. According to the teenage girl, Janet had said, Auntie, stop and let me have a breather. But the water continued to flow and the chanting screeched in their ears. Go with peace and love. Go with peace and love. Janet would not get a breather no matter how much she struggled. The more resistance she had, the more they thought it was the Makatu fighting back. And for hours this continued, and with no end in sight, the family continued to grapple Janet and the young girl. The assembly line brought the water, and the family forced that water down Janet's throat. To say the least, drowning above water is an extremely rare occurrence. As Janet struggled for her life, clenching her teeth and wrestling with her family, they had poured so much water into her mouth that she could no longer breathe. So much water flowed into her throat that the membranes in her lungs began frothing, producing a liquid further absorbed into the lungs. Eventually, her air sacs collapsed, and her body could no longer circulate oxygen to her brain or heart. Her vocal cords spasmed, and her heart beat with an abnormal rhythm. And then she swallowed her own tongue. At some point during her torturous death, her jaw had locked as well. Her clenched teeth made it difficult for the family to pour the water. And instead of thinking they had gone too far with the ritual, they had convinced themselves that the Makatu is trying to stop them. So to fight the demon, they physically pried open her jaw and kept pouring water down her throat. The family members were so utterly consumed by the frenzy of the ritual that they didn't even notice Janet had died right in front of them. Her lifeless body went limp on the bed as her chanting persevered. Go with peace and love. Go with peace and love. It wasn't until much later when Uncle Johnny began performing CPR on her that they had realized she was gone and that it was too late to revive her. But even then, the family didn't stop as they were in too deep. Even with Janet dead, they still believed the Makatu was in the house. Uncle Johnny stopped CPR and looked over to his wife, Glennis. With absolute fear in his eyes, he said that he loved her. He was not convinced the nightmare was over, and he believed any one of them was susceptible to the curse of the Makatu. They continued to hold down the teenage girl and doubled down on their ritual. The young girl looked over and saw Janet's lifeless body, and she feared that they were going to do the same to her. Through her kicking and screaming, they continued to hold her down and pour water on her, and she pleaded with them to stop. She yelled through the whole house that she was drowning and that they were going to kill her, begging them to stop. But they continued the ritual for hours. One family member even tried to gouge her eye out, giving her a black eye. And after all the abuse and torture, hours and hours of horror, the young girl fell unconscious. The long, arduous night had ended, and the morning sun had risen. In the late morning, the family called a local Maori elder known as White Dave, and upon his arrival to the house, he saw absolute terror and destruction all around him. 
He reassured the family that the Makatu was gone and immediately told them to take the young girl to the hospital and to call the police. But they waited until 5.30 that evening, at least nine hours after Janet had died, to call the police. After sorting through the crime scene and interviewing over 70 family members, investigators concluded that although 40 family members were in and out of the house throughout the week, only a select few took part in the ritual. The others stood vigil and prayed while the family leaders took charge of the ceremony. Out of all the family members that took part in the ritual, only nine of the relatives were charged with manslaughter and cruelty to a child. Cases involving Maori people have been a place of controversy in New Zealand's past, and the court wanted to maintain a sense of cultural sensitivity to the situation. The main problem was, in Maori practice, pouring large amounts of water into the eyes and mouths of the subject had never been heard of as a treatment for Makatu. Although the lifting ritual had been commonly known, or basically the exorcism, the guidelines of the process had been somewhat lost over time, and no Tohunga was present to watch over the ritual. And as it turned out, the lion statue was not as old as Uncle Jimmy had claimed. The hotel owner had said they were no older than 10 years old, and he had smeared some yogurt on them to make them look weathered in the sun. The family still stood by the belief that all they wanted to do was help Janet. And after all the evidence had been collected, cultural sensitivity became a point of contention within the trial. Throughout the six-week trial, public opinion was divided. But the trial proved that the beliefs of Janet's family were fixed and false. They were not aligned with the authentic Maori practices. And soon the jury had their verdict. Three of the family members were acquitted, and five were found guilty. The judge sentenced family leaders John Rawery and Glennis Wright to community service, and they were allowed to live at home. They sentenced the other three aunts to community service and a cultural education program, but no one served time despite Janet's death and the hours of horrific abuse inflicted on the young girl. Even though manslaughter often results in four to six years behind bars, none of the family members were sentenced to any prison time. A week later in the New Zealand suburb of small flats and quiet neighborhoods, they tore down the house of Uncle Johnny, where the horrors of darkness and death once lurked, where water had covered the floors, and Janet's body went limp. The tainted house was scraped away, forever. An empty lot sits quietly among the other houses. No running faucets or karakia chanting can be heard. All that remains are the horrid memories of the family members who believe they had done their best to help someone they love. Many of the family members think the curse of the Makatu is still active within their family and that the death of Janet Moses was only the beginning. Wow, what a tragic story. I mean, at the end of the day, really no one was held responsible and, and I get why. I get that there's cultural sensitivity here with, with these rituals, but I feel like in most other places in the world, including the U.S., something like this would not hold up in court. This is something very specific to New Zealand. I think if there was an indigenous people that did this here in the United States, I think they would have been held to the first yeah. extent of the law and probably would have been imprisoned. Right. And, they would serve some kind of prison time for this. Yeah, I mean. But they all got away with basically murdering their family member yeah yeah i think i think this is a, a tough one because it's very controversial yeah um among people especially people in new zealand and i think there's probably even some maori people that would have said that these guys just went totally against the the practices that we we preach really you know there was no tohunga present which again is like a priest to have somebody who's experienced yeah. these type of rituals to oversee to make sure that it doesn't get to the point where somebody dies is exactly is the missing piece here. So it's interesting that the, the judge didn't give them any right. sort of punishment really. And, and the family seems they weren't educated enough to make those important like decisions to perform a, the ritual correctly. Like this right. is a great example of a ritual gone wrong due to lack of education on how to, how it's performed. Right. Right. And they just thought that they were, you know, they thought that they were doing something good by, trying to drive the demon out of her, but at the end of the day, they were killing her. But I also have a hard time believing that during this whole process, as they're doing this, that they're, you know, I mean, unless there is 
a demon there that is also taking over the family members, which it seems like that whatever was possessing Janet was also possessing the rest of them and that they were in their right Mm -hmm. minds to even really know what they were doing to Janet at the time this was all happening. And they were all in this trance like stage, just right. chanting peace and love over and over and over. Right. So I could see how doing that over an extensive period of time could make them just lose sight of actually what's going on. But wouldn't it be better if, you know, they just took their time and continued the yeah. ritual for longer than going so far with it that you're literally drowning yeah. your they, loved one? And they, they shouldn't have taken it as when they were fighting back that that was the demon fighting back i mean they should have realized that hey this is an actual person here fighting back for their life right you know they couldn't see the different uh sides to that yeah and just you know it it got to a point where it was just out of their hands and that they should have got somebody more experienced involved and they refused to or at least take her to the hospital which seemingly crossed their minds and they're just like uh you know we'll keep doing this because this is what we believe is actually going on with her when in reality when you look at her episodes and what was going on with her. I mean, this could have been just a case of some sort of mental illness, Mm -hmm. you know, whether it was schizophrenia or something like that, that Janet was experiencing that could have been treated by a mental health professional that could have diagnosed Mm -hmm. her correctly. And in turn, you know, yeah. Given her the proper treatment and maybe even helped her get better to a point. And it would get her away from the house and, whatever objects they think are possessed. And I think overall that would have been the best route to go is get actual into like a mental health facility. Yeah. And that's why just possession stories are, are so difficult because, you know, depending on what you believe, I mean, unless you believe what, you know, this family believed you look at this as like, this was murder. This was a person that had severe mental illness that was just mistaken for a demon possessing her. Yeah. Based on their religious beliefs and therefore they rather than seeking medical help, which they should have went to first, go seek medical help first. If medical help doesn't doesn't Mm -hmm. know what's wrong with her, they can't do anything for her. Then maybe you start looking into, you know, rituals around or even demonic possession. Look at the Catholic Church. If it is a demonic possession possibility, then maybe. Well, they would never do that. I mean, because that conflicts with their religion, right? Yeah. And just their, you know, the culture of of the Maori people is like, you know, they don't trust white, white people, basically. I mean, so that's why they were so hesitant to go to the doctor in the first place. But I'm like, there's got to have been somebody within their culture that, would have had the knowledge yeah. to be like, guys, this is wrong. We're not, right. your guys aren't doing this right. You're literally killing her mm-hmm. when in fact you're making it worse. Like right. you're right. not helping her, you're killing her in an attempt to help her. So I, I don't know. I think this will ended up being a, one of those cases where the judge was like, if I do punish them, I mean, I'm obviously not from New Zealand. I don't know exactly what the, what the atmosphere is like between the, you know, the indigenous people and the rest of New Zealanders like, you know, I know that there is a lot of sensitivity there because you're talking about colonialism. You came to their, you know, their island and you, you know, take land from, so there's this kind of ongoing feud there. You know, Mm -hmm. it's kind of like same thing with Hawaii, like people that are indigenous to Hawaii, you know, don't like the fact that all these white people in essence came to Hawaii and colonized it and are taking land from them, stealing land, just like we did to the native Americans. I mean, I totally understand all of that and I respect that a hundred percent. Yeah. It's just, I, I feel like the judge, right. You know, didn't want to ruffle feathers. Didn't want to get like this whole debate going in the community and just decided to sort of, you know, give them a pass in a way Yeah, because of their beliefs, which again, I think would only happen in New Zealand. Right. And, and on that point, what I found was interesting was when I watched the belief Netflix documentary on the possession of Janet Moses, they did interview, you know, the neighbor who said that they could hear everything like every day, like nonstop. And, you know, he's white folk. And I think it kind of ties into that point as well on why he didn't reach out to. They don't want to interfere. They don't want to interfere. They're like, what do I know about what they're doing? He he thought they were just performing a religious, uh, you know, ceremony or something. He didn't want to be that neighbor who like shut it down. Right. Exactly. But it's, I mean, it's a good, it's a good lesson to be learned here that, 
when you hear something that doesn't sound right or you see something that doesn't look right, yeah. that no matter what it is, you know, you should at least get somebody involved that can determine whether or not yes. this is being done Because I correctly. obviously could have saved a life. Absolutely. There's no you reason know. for Janet to die over this. There's no reason to torture, you know, the poor teenage girl yeah. in the process as well, who's now mentally going to have to deal with that trauma right, the rest of right. her life of literally being like, waterboarded by your family but i'd be really interested to you to hear anybody out there who is maybe from new zealand if you remember this when this happened because i'm sure you probably did hear about this or if there's anybody from the maori people that can can kind of talk and attest to what happened here and, and what your thoughts are on it because i'd be really interested to hear more from a different perspective of somebody who just has more knowledge on you know this culture and these rituals because I think it's important to preserve this. Um, it's important to preserve the culture of indigenous peoples across the world. I 100% am supportive behind that. And I think that is of utmost importance. But at the same time, it's like when some of those rituals, you know, it would be the same thing as like back in the day, the Aztecs or Mayans, they used to do human sacrifices. You, know, oh, yeah. if you, you could say that if, imagine if there was an, an indigenous people that was doing human sacrifices in a modern culture or modern society, would that be allowed? Could they go do human sacrifices because they say this is a part of our culture? We've been doing this for thousands of years. Yeah. Would that be allowed? Well, no, it wouldn't be allowed because you're murdering somebody, you're killing somebody at the end of the day. So despite that be maybe being a tradition that was followed, it's like it comes to a point where, where do traditions and, and cultures sort of have to evolve with modern times and also adhere to sort of the standards of society and, and that it's just not okay to do this anymore. You know, you can do this to a certain extent, but when it starts literally taking the life of another, maybe it's, that's where we have to stop it. There. Right. And so I think, I think this was just a either one of two things, either this was just, they were so entrenched in this, you know, sort of exorcism and maybe there was some sort of, evil spirit involved with this i mean who am i to say there wasn't i don't know for sure but on that note so when the house was torn down i mean even the neighbor you know said that they didn't see any type of paranormal activity that was where the house was right around them i mean i'm just skeptic that this could there have was been any a, sort of of paranormal element yeah, to that this could have been more mental spirit. illness on janet's side yeah yeah that's what it, i mean that's what it seems like for sure i mean Will we ever know? Probably not because, you know, she's gone at this point and, you know, there's no way to know whether or not she was possessed by any sort of entity or not. But again, I want to know what you think about this story. What do you think about Janet? Do you think she was suffering from mental illness or maybe was she really possessed by something? And if you haven't seen the belief documentary on Netflix, definitely check it out. I mean, it followed the actual story to a T and uh, a great reenactment as well as, you know, documentary type with interviews from the family members and stuff. So yeah, it was really interesting. So definitely check that out. Yeah, definitely a very different type of possession story. That's why I thought it was interesting to cover it because it's, I mean, we're, it's a totally different culture, totally different place on the planet for one. And just, I've never, you know, to hear something playing out like this is just, is kind of unheard of, especially within your own family. You know, yeah. I thought that was really, really interesting so definitely let us know what you think but that wraps up this episode of the lights out podcast if you enjoyed it if you found it interesting make sure you leave us a like if you're watching on youtube also make sure you're subscribed on apple podcasts if you haven't already and youtube as well we really appreciate it and also if you haven't checked out josh's new podcast planet sleep oh yeah uh, we got lots of episodes you can catch up on catch yeah. some quality z's while you're at it <laughs> yeah you know definitely check out some planet sleep yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for where Planet Sleep is going. We're going to uh, dive into some ancient sites and civilizations yeah. here soon and kind of take a different turn for it other than just purely animals and nature. So I'm excited Absolutely. to see where it goes. Good call, though. Check oh, out yeah. Planet Check Sleep. We'll have, out. have all the links below because, yeah, you might need a cleansing after this episode. <laughs> uh, if you're listening to this as you're falling asleep, maybe hop over to Planet Sleep and, and give it a listen. But that is it for us today. We will see you next week with another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. But until then, lights out, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>